Hello, welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Vin, and today for Book Trek 2021, we're talking about Triangle, published in 1983 by Sandra Marshak and Myrna Colbreth. So I had chosen to read this book, um, particularly because it is a, in a way, a follow-up to Gene Roddenberry's only Trek novel. Uh, and that is the adaptation of Star Trek The Motion Picture, which I enjoyed overall. And Roddenberry kind of talks very briefly, mentions almost in passing in the beginning of the book, something about a new human movement. And um, the <laughs> authors that we're talking about today, uh, go ahead and run with that. Uh, so I was curious to see what they would do with it. And, oh boy, um, uh you can probably tell already, I did not enjoy this book. Um, I think that we should talk first about a uh, name of a trope um, that is used a lot these days. Uh, not always accurately used, um, but a trope which comes out of Star Trek fan fiction. Uh, it was birthed there, and that is that of the Mary Sue. Uh, now, we've had uh, quite a few uh, female heroes come out in entertainment um, whether it be Star Wars or even sometimes Star Trek, uh, you know, or various, various entertainment, um, where these characters are referred to as Mary Sue's, and it doesn't always fit. But it might be worth first looking into what a Mary Sue is in the original context. Uh, and it comes out of Trek fiction of the early 70s. Uh, and <laughs> these were, um, going to be referencing some stuff online here. I have a computer right off screen here. Um, especially young adolescent girls who are writing Star Trek fiction, they would kind of have an insert character that was a, kind of a fictionalized version of themselves as a way to sort of live out a certain Star Trek fantasy. Um, sometimes those are benign fantasies. Sometimes they're of a more adult sexual nature. Um, and these characters inevitably almost always were without faults. Uh, they were adored by everybody. Um, they were pretty much the, the best at everything on the ship. Uh, and it ended up being satirized. Um, there was a parody written in uh, 1973 uh, by Paula Smith. Um, and this parody story is called A Trekkie's Tale. And uh, it is about Lieutenant Mary Sue. And uh, it's it's a of course I'm gonna I'll, I'll read this story it's it's very very short, <laughs> uh, but it's having fun with the kind of fiction that was being written at that point. So this is how the story goes. Uh, again, this is uh, published in 1973, and um, it was inside a, what magazine was it? Um, a Star Trek fanzine called uh, Menagerie. Um, it says, "Gee golly gosh, Glorioski." thought Mary Sue, as she stepped on the bridge of the Enterprise. Here I am, the youngest lieutenant in the fleet, only fifteen and a half years old. Captain Kirk came up to her. Oh, lieutenant, I love you madly. Will you come to bed with me? Captain, I'm not that kind of girl. You're right, and I respect you for it. Here, take over the ship for a minute while I go get some coffee for us. Mr. Spock came to the bridge. What are you doing in the command seat, lieutenant? The captain told me to. Flawlessly logical. I admire your mind. Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock, and Dr. McCoy, and Mr. Scott beam down with Lieutenant Mary Sue to Rigel 17. Uh, they were attacked by green androids and thrown into prison. In a moment of weakness, Lieutenant Mary Sue revealed to Mr. Spock that she too was half Vulcan. Recovering quickly, she sprung the lock with her hairpin and they all got away back to the ship. But back on board... Dr. McCoy and Lieutenant Mary Sue found out the men who had beamed down were seriously stricken by the jump, jumping cold Robbies. Mary Sue less so. While the four officers languished in sickbay, Lieutenant Mary Sue ran the ship and ran it so well she received the Nobel Peace Prize, the Vulcan Order of Gallantry, and the Trouthamadorian Order of Good Guyhood. However, the disease finally got to her and she fell fatally ill. In the sick bay, as she breathed her last, she was surrounded by Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock, and Dr. McCoy, and Mr. Scott, all weeping unashamedly at the loss of her beautiful youth and beautiful beauty, intelligence, capability, and all-around niceness. Even to this day, her birthday is a national holiday on the Enterprise. 
So that's the whole story. Um, <laughs> you know, it, obviously having fun with this. Uh, and we can all agree this is, you know, <laughs> these stories sound bad uh, that she's making a parody of, right? Um, that's why it's, it's kind of shocking that a lot of that story is actually almost a blueprint for what this story is. Uh, certain points actually kind of hit one after the other, um, and it's, oh, it's, it's not good. The result is not great. Um, there, just read another very quick, very quick thing. Um, in 1976, uh, the same magazine, Menagerie, uh, they, they were an editorial about Mary Sue's, and they say Mary Sue stories, the adventures of the youngest and smartest ever person to graduate from the academy and ever to get a commission at such a tender age, usually characterized by unprecedented skill in everything from art to zoology, including karate and arm wrestling. This character can also be found uh, burrowing her way into the good graces, heart, mind uh, of one of the big three, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, if not all three at once. She saved the day by her wit and ability, and if we are lucky, has a good grace to die at the end, being grieved by the entire ship. Um, we have a situation in this book, okay, uh, where Kirk has to take this ambassador who is a member of this new human movement, which is almost like a sort of a collective hive mind. It's like human beings are evolving to be like psychically linked with each other. So, you know, with this hive mind attitude, they're, they're not really individuals anymore. Although when we see them, they don't actually seem that way. Yeah, that's part of the, this is written terribly. Uh, we see people who are supposedly a part of not just what they call the oneness, which is kind of the the, feder, the people of the Federation's version of this hive mind. There's also a more insidious version called the totality, which is supposed to be more dangerous and even more controlling, I guess. But we see people who seem to be fighting it already and after years. <coughs> um, doesn't really make sense. Uh, so they have to take this ambassador, which I don't understand why this guy's an ambassador, um, to this planet. And they end up going down to this on the way, there's a bunch of ships that are missing or something like that. Uh, they beep down to this hostile planet that has, like, gigantism in its animals, so it's super dangerous. And Spock is down there, Kirk is down there, and they meet this woman who is uh, a, a free agent. Uh, which means that she only answers to the very top head of of Starfleet. Um, or, or is it Starfleet or even just maybe the Federation? I know she doesn't have to, she doesn't have to answer to even like the, the highest admiral. Um, and free agents are like the the baddest of the badasses, apparently, of the Star Trek universe. It's not clear exactly what they're doing. Um, but they know there's a free agent down on this planet, uh, and they beam down, and the moment they see her, Kirk and Spock immediately fall madly in love with her. Uh, and, <laughs> man, um, Kirk is completely smitten. Uh, Spock, uh, it, he see, it's, it's vague exactly how some of this stuff works, uh, but he seems to be induced maybe by her part, like she has like these psionic abilities. Uh, he ends up going into Pon Far <laughs> and she has to help alleviate that. Um, and it, Kirk is also being affected by this oneness. Uh, he's being like tempted by them to join. Uh, so we have a situation where both of our are two guys here, um, they're being mentally compromised. Uh, but so there's kind of a story reason for it, but the result is that neither of them are recognizable throughout the whole novel. And they are just completely smitten head over heels but for this woman, Solothane. She's almost like a Chitara or something like that. She's half human, half somewhat feline, I guess. Uh, and of course, you know, she's beautiful, she's smart. It just gets absolutely ridiculous. Uh, Spock is, you know, he, he, he's so impressed by her logic. It, uh, it matches his. And of course, she's like, they say she was the first non-Vulcan to compete in logic, I don't know, tournaments or events or something like that on Vulcan. Uh, she's psychically linked with T'Pau. <laughs> she, uh, she's the best fighter out of all of them. She's absolutely deadly and physical. Uh, you know, it, you name it, she can do it. Uh, and she knows it. Uh, she even teaches Spock a little bit about 
um, like Earth mythology, everything like that. Like Spock wouldn't already know this stuff. Uh, and it's it's as absurd as it sounds, um, and it's really bad. Um, <laughs> we have also um, yes. So Spock, like I said, he he is not recognizable in that way um, with how he's falling for her and how he's acting. He's just kind of angry the whole time and yelling. Um, the dialogue is very melodramatic. Uh, you know, it's the kind of dialogue that you, you know that people are thinking this is really good stuff, this is really smart, and it just comes off weird. And there's certain pages where the dialogue, every single line has like an italicized word. So you know they really mean it. You know, they're really emphasizing what they're saying. Um, meanwhile, Kirk, you know, I said these guys aren't recognizable. Kirk is like spending most of the novel going unconscious and being lifted by the strong arms of a man. Uh, so in addition to Sola Thane there, um, and what we end up having this triangle, like a love triangle, which ends up being more like polyamorous than anything else, um, we also have a certain level of homoeroticism going on here. Uh, and Kirk spends most of this novel as like, you know, it's like, it's like Kirk in The Perils of Pauline. Um, he is constantly, he, at one point he's swimming and he almost drowns and, uh, he's saved by this man. Of course, we have to hear about their big strong arms, pull him out and they keep like kneading his muscles and stuff like that. And he thinks it's Spock. Uh, it ends up being that ambassador guy, uh, that's on the ship that he doesn't quite trust. Um, but over and over again, Kirk is falling unconscious and he's getting picked up by a guy and carried around, uh, like, like he's a fainting damsel. Um, it's, it's just, it's ridiculous. Uh, you know, the Kirk is not Kirk in this, uh, Spock is not Spock. Um, and this is supposed to take place after Star Trek, the motion picture. So these guys are like middle-aged men, uh, and they don't act it. You don't get a sense of that at all in here. I don't know if it's because the enterprise that's on this cover is not, it's not the refit enterprise. It's from the show. So you would expect them to be, you know, younger guys in this whole thing. Um, and a lot of the things that I, I read about, that I, I read to you about that, that Mary Sue parody, happened in this. You know, everybody loving this central female character. She is awesome at everything. And even the ending, I'm not going to give a spoiler in case you really want to read this. It's not exactly what was in that story, but it's the equivalent. All right. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it should be embarrassing more than anything else. Uh... You know, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at some of my notes here that I have on the screen. I have a lot of notes, and a lot of it is just like, oh my god, you know, Kirk is fainting again. Uh, he's unconscious again. Uh, now, oh wow, she's, you know, she's got this another amazing ability. Um, and we have some clunky, uh, clunky racial identification in this as well. Um, not handled well. I had talked about in my Spock Must Die video that, you know, the original series absolutely had... Um, you know, had a right to be proud of the diversity of its cast. Um, but some authors, if they're not quite good, I think, uh, don't handle showing that diversity very well. Um, like, you know, when you finally actually see Sulu in this, uh, after we're kind of given his name, uh, within the very next paragraph, she's referred to as like the Oriental Helmsman or something. Uh, you know, I think it's what, what they call him. And it's like, this is, you know, <laughs> uh, and I, unnecessary description uh there and the thing is this is 1983 so this is after you know if you watched uh steve donahue's um very good uh star trek the original series starter kit um he talks about the pre-lore lawyer age of star trek fiction and the post-lawyer age this is post-lawyer um and you really shouldn't have had mary sue's coming into this now both of these authors, uh, they're, I know they're dedicated objectivists. Uh, they, you know, adored Ayn Rand. Um, you know, that's already makes me suspicious <laughs> of them. Uh, I think it was, uh, Myrna Colbreth, I believe. Um, she wrote an essay that analyzed Spock's personality, um, for an objectivist approach, I think in the early 70s, and it got Gene Roddenberry's attention, and I guess he liked that analysis of Spock. Um, and I will say before, you know, I've spent a lot of time bashing these two women, um, and I do, I think this book is awful, but they do deserve some credit, some respect for helping to keep Trek fiction alive. 
Uh, they collected tons of other people's fan fiction and they put them into collections and short story collections. Um, and they had some other kind of pre-lawyer <laughs> novels, which I also have heard are not very good. Um, although I think Steve Donahue likes The Order of the Phoenix. I don't know if that's maybe a guilty pleasure. <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't think that he would say it's a great novel, but I think he enjoys it more on like a, you know, a guilty pleasure, whatever that means. I, 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 you know, it's, that's not always the best way to describe it. Uh, but it's something that you know isn't great, but you still have a great time with. Um, so, uh, yeah, this, this was rough. Um, I, in addition to all that, in addition to all that, I will say one more thing I didn't like, um, it is repetitive. It, it just, it's, you know, it's one of those books where, um, they say like, you know, maybe it was this, or maybe it was the exact opposite. And they keep doing that sort of thing. Like, it's like, Ooh, that's really going to make me think, but no, they beat things to death. Uh, cause eventually we have Sola having to choose between Kirk and Spock and, I think it goes page after page of this and them agonizing over, oh, what if I choose the wrong person? Or what is the other one going to think of me? And they're bouncing back and forth. And it just, it, it's agonizing in a lot of ways. Now, I would have dnf this, honestly, if it wasn't so short. Um, it's 188 pages, uh, which, you know, the, the chapters, though, are incredibly, they're very short. And there's also, you know, uh, here's the end of one chapter, the beginning of the other. You have all this white space here. Uh, so it still moves very quickly, although you feel it. For a short book, you still feel it. Um, if this was a longer Trek novel, I probably would have just given up halfway through because I just thought it was that bad. Uh, it was because it was so short as far as the chapters go. Um, I was able to, to finish it. Um, and I kind of, I kind of just pushed through and finished it, uh, because I wasn't enjoying it. But, um, I did end up finishing it. Uh, I'm never going to read it again. I'm definitely not going to keep this. I'm going <laughs> to... I'll, I'll donate it, I guess, <laughs> somewhere. Uh, but yeah, um, this is my last book for the first month of Book Trek 2021, uh, where we were looking at the original series. Next month, uh, September, we are looking at The Next Generation. So I'm kind of ending on a downer. I enjoyed the other ones that I read for this month. Uh, but it's kind of like it's kind of like watching the original series and having to end with Turnabout Intruder. Um, yeah, not the best way to end uh, the original series, but there you have it. Uh, that's where I am. So, um, yeah, Star Trek, Triangle, don't recommend it. Thank you, BookTube.